we were super successful on track, off track. It was probably the most difficult year of my life. Darren Lawrence needs all the credit. All of it. Between World Supercross and the Super Motocross World Championship at the moment. I'll say this. Cool. So, Yurev Konsky, first guest on the Ride Network, my first guest, and it means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. Obviously, we've known each other for a long time. So, yeah, stoked to have you on the show for the first time. I don't do these that often, and uh, when you reached out, I know that you're very passionate about what you do, and uh, when you put your name to something, it's all about integrity. So, I was comfortable. We'll see where this goes. It's not something I often do, but um, I'm certainly looking forward to it. I've seen you involved in it in so many different capacities within the sport, whether it be the Honda Smart program, whether it be promoting the Supercross Championship in 2008, whether it be the Stroke publication that you did, you know, and then the Honda Factory program sort of globally at this point. So, you know, what is it about this sport? Because it can't just be the two wheels and the engine and the exhaust. It can't just be that, you know, what is it about this sport that makes that level of sacrifice worth it to you? You know, I think I was 10 when I first uh, rode a motorbike. I was at my uh, cousin's place. It was Jason, Daniel, and uh, Renate. And um, they had this Z50 out the back, red. I think the seat was black. And uh, things weren't great at home. Mum and Dad were going through some troubles, you know. And, uh, you know, sadly they separated, but... I got on this motorbike, dad fell off the back and I, I rode straight into a fence and uh, I fell in love with it. Like it was, it was, I think everyone's probably got a similar story. Like, you know, I wasn't scared of falling over, I played footy, but I, I got back up off this bike and this bike had so much power and I was very little. If I can figure this out, there was a real connection. I think that's one thing about motorcycle sport. There's that connection you make with your bike. I started running events back in, I think, 1999 when we were running local supercross out at Broadford. We, we helped build the track out there. Some of the people that you see today, Adam Bailey, Daniel Howley, you know, Adam Robinson, you know, they were all competing there. I, I remember, you know, I'm going off on a different direction here. We'll get back to the question, but... You know, you're making me think, which is cool. We were traveling in a high ace van and there were kangaroos. I'd never seen kangaroos on the road and they were slipping. It was really early in the morning. It was icy, but all of these things come back to the one question you said about the sacrifice. You love something, you fall in love with something. It should never feel like a sacrifice, like ever. Anything that you form a relationship with, you know, whether it's your, your partner, your children, the sport that you love, the subjects in school that you love, your job. I don't feel like I've sacrificed anything. If I'm really honest and I'm being genuine, I, I don't feel like I've sacrificed the thing. I just feel like I'm doing something I love every day. So, I mean, what's there to sacrifice if you get to do that? Yeah, I don't ever sit back and think I've given up something to do this because it's what I want to do. You know, you don't share a lot. I don't think, and you haven't been on these podcasts, you haven't done stuff like this, but we know with what you do share, and it's something that I think the industries have seen, you know, quite a lot is that sort of iconic taxi photo with you and your dad and the bike and everything like that. So everything that you've come from, you know, how meaningful is it to, to come from, you know, pretty much nothing of what you had to where you are today? What have I learned from my dad? I'm often asking that as I get older and as I see my dad get older and a little bit more fragile, I'm often looking back and going, okay, sir, what did dad teach me? Because we're so different. We're, we're very different people. It's amazing. We started this talk talking about sacrifice and he drove a taxi and uh, him and mum separated and he, he lived in a, in a very humble one bedroom unit. It was hard to see actually. And, uh, he never ever complained as though he was sacrificing nothing because he was doing something he loved with his three kids. So thank you for that. I haven't thought of it that way. M maybe he helped me with that, that you don't ever feel like you're sacrificing something if you love it. So yeah, he loved us three kids. 
I can't imagine the hours he spent and the kilometres he drove so we could ride dirt bikes. Three of us, my brothers Michael and David, I got the unique name. Uh, that's another story. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly made me more grateful. I was difficult as a child. I wanted so much in this sport and dad had limits because of money. And when you're competing against other people on the start line and you see everyone as equal, it was always hard to live with that. So I was hard as a child because I wanted to get to a certain level in this sport and that took money. Um, I've certainly learned to be so much more grateful today. He went without the holidays. He went without a nice car. He went without nice clothes. Mm -hmm. All he cared about was his three kids getting to the start line and having hot food. I remember breaking my ankle at uh, Ballarat and uh, I was in real pain. I'd got ridden over my first race, I think on a 125, and all my dad cared about was if I had hot food. <laughs> so that tells you a little bit about my dad. I was very competitive. I was really distraught about not being able to race and all he cared about was did I have hot chips. Yeah, I ended up spending the week in hospital up there. I think dad told mum that I, I spent the week with a friend, but I know that there are millions of people that haven't even traveled on an airplane. And when I look back at what dad gave up so we could ride dirt bikes, I'm very grateful and humbled by the opportunity. Yeah. It's so cool. And it speaks volumes to what you said that, you know, if it's something that you love and your dad was, you know, you three boys and for you, it's the racing and everything that there isn't a sacrifice really that it doesn't exist. So I think it speaks to that. And then, you know, moving on from that side of things to the level that you're at in the sport, I think that, you know, everyone associates the Honda program, at least here in Australia with the iconic flame bikes. You know, talk about your entry into the Honda program. And, and I think it must've been around that time period, you know, where that relationship with Honda began from the factory perspective. I didn't anticipate having a race team that early on. It was 2003. I had only recently received an opportunity with another manufacturer. Our smart riding schools were going great. I was running supercross events. I think I was 24 or 25 years of age and our events were successful. And I started the Thumbercross series and that was successful. The industry here really uh, appreciated that championship and warmed to it because it um, suited our market. I co-founded a TV show with Brendan Bell and Glenn McDonald. The three of us got together. We used uh, uh, individual skills to bring that show to life. And um, 2000, I had someone that was wanting to start a race team. I already had a couple of minor amateur race teams. I, I helped Brent Hewitt. Um, I mean, the list is long. Adam Robinson, Ben Williams, Adam Bailey. I, I formed the Peter Stevens Suzuki program and created uh, opportunities through suppliers where all of the riders got support to some level where there were contingencies and Peter Stevens dollars. And then, you know, with Yamaha, I created the junior development team that branched out to be Australia wide. And back then, you know, we had Cade Mozik was on the Yamaha junior development team. I mean, there were riders all over Australia and then we really push to have dealer teams. Maybe a year or two after that, YJDT for Mosey would have been on the full throttle sports Honda. Correct. He came across, which was great. You know, he was with us from a young age and it was really difficult to walk away from that. But I wanted to grow a, a national program with our riding schools. And the truth is Yamaha wanted me to focus on Victoria because they had Gawley nationally. I wanted to start doing events and I wanted to have a team that you know, I've always had the mentality, if I'm going to go and compete, well, we, we better compete to win. I don't want to participate, um, especially when I'm asking people to put support towards something. You know, there's an expectation we're going to deliver results. Anyway, 2003 was the first year with Honda. They liked the idea of the National Schools Program, more so than the race team. They had a team at that stage. And I had someone that was 
encouraging me to, to start this team. I don't regret it. I can't live with regret, but it was certainly one of the most difficult years of my life. 03? 03. We were super successful on track, off track financially. It was probably the most difficult year of my life. That person that got involved pulled out. And I was too proud to tell anyone at the time. And I maintained running that team all year. We finished second in the Supercross Championship in the Premier Class, come close to winning with Troy Doran. We finished second in the 125 Outdoors. I think that was the first year of the second year Yamaha were allowed to run their 254 stroke, which was really difficult to compete against on the CR 125. But we did a great job. Troy finished second. Joy Harvey had a great year. Uh, Lee Ellis had a decent season. Uh, Robbie Madison was left without a bike and a ride, so I supported him with bikes. Uh, Robbie Fally, the first guy that did a backflip, I supported him with bikes. But partway through that year, um, our primary partner pulled out. And, you know, at the end of the year, I was left with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. And um, it was difficult. Took me a while to pay it back. Um, worked through it. Honda were great. Honda were fantastic. And so were all of our other partners. And our schools were super successful. They were a big part of why I was able to work through it. And I continued to run events. I think the year after, in 2004, I ran 55 schools, uh, three state supercross events. I think it was six thumper crosses. And, um, yeah, it just didn't stop working. Yeah. And uh, we still ran a junior team that year. We ran Honda's junior program that year. I think it was Sean Williamson. I think it might have been Tasmania. We won the Australian Junior Championship. With Sean, great guy, becomes super successful in business, owns Energex Logistics. Yeah. So one of the bigger logistics companies out of South Australia, super proud of him. We keep in contact. We talk about different things in business and life. But yeah, 2003, it, it could have killed me. I didn't anticipate it. I made a lot of mistakes, but I learned so much. I learned it quickly. Mm. Well, that's a young age too at that time. Yeah, it was. Everything I learned from that um, has certainly uh, helped me be where I am today. But it was definitely a, a difficult year. I'm, I'm probably not. Uh, I'm probably not opening up enough about it. But it was definitely a difficult year for me. It uh, it took its toll. Yeah. But I was glad we rebounded and rebounded quickly. And, um, you know, we, we've come through and, and, and been reasonably strong in the sport. So I didn't expect you to ask that question. I haven't really talked about that. Now that's probably the, one of the primary reasons I became quite a recluse when it comes to the media. Uh, I just keep to myself and just focus on the things that are in front of me. But yeah, that was a difficult year. We came back strong, one in 2004. In 2005, we raced with Corey Sargent in the motocross championship. We did okay. I think we won a round at Horsham, if my memory serves me correctly. And um, schools were super strong. I mean, many of today's coaches came through Honda Smart Schools. And I'd like to think that I inspired some of them to, to believe that if I can do it, they can do it. Yeah. And I've, I've never frowned at other people succeeding after being a part of our program or seeing how we do things because it's extremely rewarding. You know, I, I see the success of Shane Boyd, Cameron Taylor, and there are many other names that, you know, I, I won't mention, but, you know, that definitely came through our schools or are a part of our program. I really supported a lot of pros back in the day to give them a secondary income and show them what's possible. And, uh, you know, some of them are super successful today and I'm proud of them all. So yeah, 2007, uh, 2005, sorry, it was Kate Mosey. And we won everything. Well, almost won everything. I don't want to say we won every single race we competed in, but I think we won motocross championship, the junior motocross championship. Some races were run with the Australian seniors. I think we won that. We won 
many supercrosses. I can't remember if we won the supercross title. We might have. Um, 2006, I ran Cade and Peter Boyle. Super proud because I coached Peter from a, a younger age. I remember his mum, Helen, bringing him out. Yeah, to see him go on and win some Australian off-road championships, I think it just blew people away. Incredible talent. Incredible talent. Got in his own way sometimes, but incredible. Like, didn't believe in himself enough. I'll go on record as saying I think he had as much talent as, as Toby Price, but just had a different way of, of life. He's super successful now with PBI, the Peter Boyle Ride Park. So I'm proud to see what he's done, and he's a great father. But, yeah, we had a good year in 06. And then, you know, the things that people don't see through 03, and there's some of the things that helped me, you know, stay on top in business. I remember undertaking me to their agency at the time. Wilson Everhard was their agency. And I sat down, and again, I was young, and I was sitting in there and, getting a lay of the land of what some of these agency execs thought of our sport or our consumers. And then I was asked to convey what I thought. I ended up doing some TV commercials for Honda, which was super cool. I did a lot of print advertisements. Um, they're things I really love. I love the creative. It's probably a side that people don't see. They just see me at the racetrack with the truck. But at the back end, I really enjoy being involved in the creative side and just started developing all of that with Honda, but then I had to prove myself, you know, still today I'm doing different things with them. And, you know, 07, we ran the factory 250 team and, uh, we had a, a reasonably good year. It was Dixie Anderson, Peter Boyle and Cameron Taylor. It's unfortunate Cameron, I think broke his shoulder before the season started super cross. I can't remember. He got injured. Remember Digsy Anderson won the opening round at Broadford. You know, I never think of these things. You're making me think. So in 07, I sat down with Honda and um, they wanted to outsource their off-road program. I still don't know how I got it, to, to be honest. I don't, but I was given the opportunity to take over their motocross, supercross program. And, um, yeah, haven't looked back. Mm. Well, I think you look through like all of that time period, right? And you say the factory 250 program, which I think and believe were the Shell Hondas. Yeah. The Shell Hondas, the full throttle sports Hondas with Mosig, even when he entered into the pros in 06. Because the factory team was sort of its standalone thing. I think it was ran by Pip Harrison or someone Great like that. Great guy. Great yeah. guy. Very clever human being. Yeah. Very, very clever. But it was in that very sort of, you know, in that relationship period. But it moves on slightly to the next one which is you know you listed the riders you've worked with and the list goes on you talk about shell honda you know josh kasha kasha we won championships with him on the 150 yeah which was super cool and to see how where he is in life right now he's probably one of the people i'm most proudest of he doesn't live in a mansion or drive fancy cars but what a phenomenal father of three and uh, to see where he is today what he endured in the sport, the highs and the lows that we spoke about when we weren't talking in front of the camera. Extraordinary. So super proud of him. But yeah, there are a lot of riders. I think I know you secondary in that commercial sense, right? Because I've seen that and been privy to that later in my life. But initially, it was like you were working with everyone almost. But it transitions into, you know, you've got so many teams around the world now, it seems, from the AMA here and the World Series. So when you're, you know, putting together these teams yearly with riders and contracts and motocross and supercross, you know, two different disciplines, I think one year Townley was outdoors only for you, you know, you have to consider those things. What is that process like, I guess, at the tail end of a year and entering the year and getting the right riders for the series that you're going to be racing and being confident with them? Any team manager or team owner company directors that say you aren't taking the risk of lying to themselves you hope you've made the right decision you can base it on analytics i look at data i look at 
previous data, I look at things that might go, you know what, with the right opportunity, that rider is showing that he could potentially be something or she could be something. Is Sorry to jump in, but is Anstey a good example of that? Because, you know, he hasn't shown up until this year a great deal in Supercross and he's sort of been a revelation this year. So, so Marty and I, Martin Dabalos and I, were looking at last year who, who we were going to sign for this year or, you know, World Supercross, we didn't even know really about that at the time when we were speaking to Max. I wanted 250 riders, you know, so Marty was speaking to Max and saying to Max, you know, we want you back on a 250. And I'd gone back through the analytics and noticed, I think it was his first ever Supercross. On Star? No, he came over as a privateer. Believe it or not, it was Giacomo Garibaldi, who now heads up the HRC team in Europe, that either funded it or took him over. Qualified well. I think he qualified second, maybe. The end result doesn't depict how well he did because I think he got taken out maybe by Weimar or they came together or something happened. might have been Weimar. Anyway, but he was right up there. So I go back and look at old videotapes and really start to analyse all of the information because it's all archived in the Supercross uh, website, all the results. And start picking the different things. But I look at the fact he might have finished eighth or ninth, but then I go to look at the lap time and look at the best lap time and think, okay, what could have been, you know, then you've got to appreciate the different level of motorcycles getting off the start line, making it off the jump. When, when you're there, you see the difference between the factory bikes and the privateer bikes. And you only have to look at Max's history in, in Europe. Like the guy can ride a dirt bike. Yeah. You very quickly learn from a rider what makes them tick, how to work with them, and how to get the most out of them. But you also very quickly realize who's full of shit. You know, because, you know, well, I'm, 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 I don't want to admit my age, but I'm 48 now. And, you know, I've been helping riders since I was 15. Like, I think I was 15 or 16 and... Cameron Sinclair and Mick Sinclair will tell you I was doing resumes for them when I was 17, like for their dad. Um, really basic resumes, but back then they were decent for what it was. And so for a long time I've been helping riders and, and you really learn to identify which ones are full of shit and have excuses all the time and which ones are trying to tell you this is the way to get the most out of me. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, I, straight up made some massive mistakes like you know trying to get the best out of a rider by criticizing them because you think that you know by grabbing them and shaking them and telling them how amazing they are but how shit they rode but how great they could be that might pep them up the age-old characterization of, of rocky balboa just keep pushing him and telling him he's he's terrible you know, Mickey telling him he's never going to eventuate to something, but that makes him want it more. That works with some riders, but it cripples others. So you very quickly learn how to get the best out of a rider. And I certainly still make mistakes today because uh, I'm still learning the rider uh, early on in the relationship. So I, I make that mistake. Uh, hopefully you don't go too far and you don't jeopardize the relationship or jeopardize trust. Josh Kasia was someone that you'd grab and you'd go, let's get this done. There'd be a lot more other words that you would use, but he would respond really well. Cade Mozik would respond really well. Peter Boyle wouldn't. Wilson Todd, Brody Conley, not necessary. Kyle Webster, you can give him a rub. The, the, better, the, the more you get to know him, you can tell him he can get the shit done. And he kind of wants to hear it. You don't want to kill his confidence if he has a bad race, but you can tell him to get in there and put his elbows up. Yeah. Tanley, you didn't need to tell him anything. Yeah. And he told you that you didn't need to tell him anything. Mm -hmm. He didn't need to be told that he was great, and he didn't need to be told that he had done something terrible because he already knew it. He just needed to know where he could improve, and you had to back it up. And then you got people like... Justin Brayton, who is extremely methodical, no nonsense, break the track down. I've made the mistake sometimes of seeing obstacles that aren't there. He reminds me of that. And 
look at what other riders are doing and again analyze what's going on on the track provide him with that information let him process it but don't over coach him yeah um so constantly learning but the one thing that you realize when you're dealing with champions of that caliber dean wilson max anstey justin bright yeah uh, ken roxon uh -huh. they know when they've made a mistake they're accountable and they have a really good idea of what they feel they need to fix it so we better listen and we need to decipher between everything between the emotion of a bad result and the reality of what might or might not be working and try and work with those particular riders to make the best decision to put them in the best place to move forward and i'm going to say in all honesty that really uh, hit home with ben i initially felt uh vulnerable uh, and intimidated because i None of his success. World champion. We really connected on a completely different level when he got hurt at Coonabarra Brad. I saw how vulnerable a rider could be. You know, he went through some stuff. Then he had, what people may or may not know, I had let him out of the contract with us because he had signed to race with Chad. 2-2. Two, two. I had put my biggest package together for a rider you know almost in the history of, of my time with honda back then i didn't want to hold him back and he sat down he goes this might be my last chance chad's got hurt there's an opportunity for me to go and compete in america i know you've given me this chance you've sold it to all of your sponsors keep in mind we just dominated conondale yeah and i believe it was from that moment onwards that everyone elevated to another level everyone went home from Conadale going we're not there Ben established what the level needed to be following that weekend it was like you can I take this ride can you let me out of the contract yep no worries we agreed to let him out I told all my sponsors that he was out you know it was clean yeah we paid him some monies I didn't care I wanted this relationship with him and, and I the relationship that him and I've been building, just don't lend him your um, your personal car. Uh, thinks he's a stunt driver. But um, yeah, he looked at me and said, this is my chance. I, I want to go back. I'm in the best shape physically and mentally that I've been in a long time. I'm ready to go. And he was. He was ready to do damage in America again. I genuinely believe he got hurt. I remember we were out at the chopper. You could just see it. He was broken. Physically, he was broken quite badly. Chad obviously didn't require his services. He wasn't able to race. Yeah. And he's rang me up and he's gone, you know, shit, you I've got my whole family and I don't have any contract now. And I'm like, I know this is going to be a long road home, but it's okay, we'll work through it together. I paid him all the way through and, you know, he raced Supercross that year. He came back in 2000 and I think it was 15 in preparation to race NA. Yeah. And killed it at MXON that year. Yeah, but the greatest thing for me was he rang me up and said, Yurif, can we do something? That's how strong our relationship was. Yeah. The the, the full circle there is is that, you know, I, I saw Brody Conley, you know, he talked about looking for riders. I saw Brody Conley at the MX of Nations last year in America. You know, I was fortunate to be there. First MX of Nations I've been to. Um, extraordinary event. Just remarkable. Just, yeah, wow. The vibes are crazy. And I'm watching this guy get round on a Yamaha and I'm thinking, this kid's just got heart. Who is he? Again, went back to my analytics, realised that he raced in Australia only a couple of rounds last year. Out of respect, I rang uh, BT. And I'm like, who's this kid? I mean, he has a relationship with Yamaha that I respect Ben has. And I'm like, I'm going to sign this kid. I see something special in this kid, really special. And um, what's rewarding is I don't know what Ben may or may not have told Brody. Yeah. But clearly it came with some level of endorsement. And that meant the world to me. That probably validated 
the things that I do more so than some championships that we've won. Because there's a world champion potentially telling a rider, yep, that team's worth racing for. So that to me was priceless. So everything I did with Ben back in the day was worth it. It paid for it then. Yeah. And obviously I don't have any idea what he may or may not have said to Brody, but that one acceptance or, or recommendation from Ben to someone that he's obviously um, look, looked after or was looking after, yeah, that, that validated to me that some of the things I'm doing must be okay because I'm constantly questioning it. So, you know, getting back to what you originally said was, you know, how do you pick your riders? Well, you're careful. You, you definitely look for the certain values in a rider. Ethics are everything to me. Uh, they really are. You know, you, you better want to win in our program. Uh, the, you know, real expectation that you better come here wanting to win. No excuses. I, I don't do excuses. I do solutions. I don't expect it to be perfect every day, but we, we strive for perfection and we figure out how to get there. Yeah. Um, and when we're not there, we work together as a team to get there. And those that um, aren't willing to commit, yeah, they don't have a place here. But yeah, I think all teams go into the start of a season going, okay, where are we? Have we done everything right? It's difficult to measure the off season. Um, our motorcycle tracks, very different to car racing and superbike racing. They're never the same. They boarded differently one day from the next. They're ripped differently one day from the next. The up ramps are prepared differently one day from the next. So lap after lap, they're different. And that's what's unacknowledged. Yeah, there's no exact science to ensuring that you're always moving forward. A lot of it is feel. So all of the testing and preparation you do in the off season, you, you can't necessarily quantify until the gate drops. You definitely try and put your best foot forward. You pick the, the riders that you feel will fit your program and that can win. And then you do everything you can during the off season to be prepared for round one. But unless you've got a program somewhat similar to say, Alden Baker's program in America, where you've arguably got four to eight of the top 10 that you can measure against one another, it's, it's difficult to measure where you're at going into a season. It's very calculated with a program like that. But, you know, sidebar with the riders, you've obviously worked with Townley and some really great names. But I think, you know, with the World Supercross Championship last year, you got the opportunity to work with Ken Roxon, who is a flat out superstar in the sport and one of the most talented riders to ever come through this sport. So talk about what it was like, one, you know, to have Ken on the team, the sort of peculiarities that, you know, he came with. And I guess the. An athlete of that greatness, you know, I think that their expectations would be quite high that everybody is on the same page. I've been fortunate enough to work with the likes of Justin Brayton and, you know, Ben Townley. People forget that I think it was 012, Brayton was in the podium quite regularly riding for factory Honda. So with that comes a certain expectation of what he expects to be delivered. And then I've learned from Ben and they're just blokes. So I wasn't intimidated when Ken turned up at the track. I was, just, I was probably more um, fearful of his agent. We all know Steve shows a lot of emotion, which is great. He's very passionate, but he shows a different emotion to what Ken does. You know, Ken doesn't bring um, business to the track his business that he brings to the track is a pair of boots and a helmet Brayton's both so you're sitting down and you're negotiating with Justin the manager of Brayton Incorporated and so was Townley so with Ken it was actually really easy the first time I really met Ken was last year we had just finished fifth and fifth at Southwick and we went out and did some testing at his place. Honda were trying and um, we went out there and Brayton had given me some shit about the way I ride a dirt bike and watch out for your roof. 
I didn't get the chance to ride. I was super bummed. We were testing, testing. I went and did four laps and then I bucketed down. So I was spewing. I was looking forward to doing some riding and with him. But, mate, between him and his dad, because his dad was there, Lars was there, some Honda Cobra people were there. It was super easy. Then when the opportunity came to work with him for World Supercross, it was a no-brainer. But I certainly put myself, and Martin did as well, and the people that we surrounded the program with under pressure to deliver. But the program that him and Courtney have, I mean, Courtney just told him after a few test sessions, get on the bike and ride it. And he did. And wow. Ken drove, I think, four or five hours to come to the track to ride with us. Uh, he came out to MTF. And, I mean, we were finishing six, seven at night. And, um, yeah, it, it was super easy with Ken. It was like dealing with someone I'd been with for years. If I'm really honest, I don't know why the, we connected so well. I knew after the first few test sessions, like, it was he was easy to read. He seriously just wants to win. He loves riding his dirt bike. There's no denying it. He could probably retire now and doesn't need the problems or the anxiety that you, you deal with, the pressures that you have to deal with at that level and the expectations that are always on him after all of the injuries. But I think that's why we connected because I knew he was always giving 100%. Mm -hmm. You certainly want to be competing at that level. Yeah. We're talking about extracting the most out of riders. And I think that we've seen the Baker program, we've seen MTF, we've seen these facilities where it's so regimented where people ride and how they ride and their accountability and what they do. And then there's the, obviously the flip side of it, the people who don't ride and train there. I think the Lawrence brothers are a pretty good example of success having not gone through a program like that. So talk about that from a team perspective, because you are very closely aligned to MTF, the strengths, the weaknesses, and, you know, I guess essentially like what you think's the pros and cons of each scenario. I want to go back and talk a little bit more about the riders because I didn't get to mention you know, working with Kyle and Jed, but we can go back to that in a minute because it'll relate to this because they might not be racing AMA Supercross, but their wins here in Australia are equally as exhilarating for me and equally as hard to achieve. You brought up the Lawrences. Their program, I mean, is just as regimented as Cooper Webb's. This is where the importance of surrounding yourself, not only with like-minded people, but people that fit, people that will be honest with you, um, and people that want the best from you. I mean, there's a hundred movies and books out there that show it, you know, the new Creed movies, Rocky Balboa's in his corner. I mean, I love sport movies. The Lawrences have Lucas Myrtle. He's focused on the external commercial side, brand image likeness. He's selling all of that. He gets it. He's arguably one of the best at it. Yeah. Lucas is raw. He's quite new to what he's doing relative to some of the other people in that space. And he just sees things differently. But again, he's one of those people in their, in their group. And then you've got Johnny O'Mara. People probably don't give Johnny O enough credit. And then prior to that, they were in Europe. And you had Everts. And from my understanding, Kenny's dad was there giving them some guidance with Supercross. Your dad's a sponge too. Darren Lawrence needs a lot of credit there too. Darren Lawrence needs all the credit. All of it. Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that what his kids are doing, his kids are doing. But the greatest asset that Darren has, in my mind, is the ego's checked outside the door. There's none there. Darren's like, okay, cool. Was I the world's greatest motocross rider? No. Who was? Cool, Johnny O. Great, let's put Johnny O there. What's Johnny O bring? A very humble approach. A very focused approach. He's very diligent and arguably one of the best ever to ride a dirt bike back in the day. And to be able to achieve the things that he achieved. Now let's check back again. Who was Ricky Carmichael with originally? Johnny Anna. Darren 
is the ultimate leader. You'd have Darren run a business and it would be successful. And the reason it would be successful is he's got no ego. Darren's identified to succeed at something, you need great people. Roger DeCosta has identified to, to achieve something, you need great people. You need a great chassis department. You need a great motor department. You need a great nutritionalist. You need a great trainer. You need to put people that are like-minded together to aspire one another to be greater. It's all about evolution, building on one another, creating a platform and building on it, but surrounding yourself with the right people. That requires a great deal of strength because you're going to constantly be criticized and questioned. It obviously requires a, a great deal of resilience. But most importantly, it requires you to go, it's not about you. And there are a lot of people in this world that can't do that. It's part of the reasons why I don't like these podcasts. And I hate, I really, I don't hate, hate's a, a, the wrong word. It's, 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 it's a powerful world, a word I don't like. I struggle when I go and put something on or get involved with something. I'm constantly being thanked. We'd, we'd like to thank you, Reeve. And, uh, you know, I put on an event at One Thaggy. I don't. I come up with an idea. The club puts it on. The sponsors commit to it, which enables us to get the, the better prize money. But I get the credit, which is what I feel really uncomfortable about. I see Darren Lawrence as one of the, the greatest leaders of our time in this sport and someone who doesn't get the credit he deserves because he doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. But he goes to bed every night and looks across at his entire family and he goes, yeah, I've made this. That's his purpose in life. He has given up on all of his pers personal dreams and they're about his children. That's what makes him the greatest person, human being. Like I have a lot of time for Darren Lawrence, a lot. And if there was someone I'd like to have dinner with, I would actually say I'd like to sit down and have a chat with him. And if anyone wanted to learn how to take their children to their best level, not necessarily to, to Jet's level, to any particular level in any particular sport, I'd like to sit down with Darren because he has identified all of his weaknesses and that's his bloody greatest strength. And, um, yeah, I, I, I get excited thinking about what that father has done. Yeah. So that's ultimately what it comes down to is recognizing the right people to put in place regardless and irrespective of where it is for that and, success. And realizing how you best utilize your time. When you think MTF, it's Colleen, it's Brian, you know, Marty's there and been there for a long time. Is that essentially what you get out of that? Like the tracks are great. It's a pristine facility, but it is the right people in the right place. A hundred percent. And, but then it comes down to the individual that wants to capitalize on those tools that are in front of them. Like, <laughs> stupid, but it's, it's a fact. You can lead someone to water, you can't make them drink. Yeah. So, you know, providing people with the right tools to be the best version of themselves is what we try to do, whether it's me as a, a team owner or team principal or team manager. The coach does the same thing. It provides the tools. Uh, coach identifies that everyone needs to be coached slightly differently. It doesn't necessarily all work the same. Identifying what works best for the athlete, uh, which, which is key. But yeah, those particular places like MTF, I mean, Bakers is exclusive to the KDM group. Um, they've been very clever and they've been very successful. Star, Bort, um, Carmichael Farm, and Jeannie's amazing. Uh, you know, she's very analytical and very structured, hence Ricky's success, both during the sport and after the sport. He's learned about structure. Well, accountability. I mean, he's been super successful, and I think that that definitely stems from there. The things that we don't see are the Davy Millsaps that are helping some riders, Nick Way that's helping, you know, McAdoo and AC. People get hurt in this sport, so you don't necessarily see the result that they could achieve hadn't they got hurt. But most of the top athletes in this world, in in all different types of sport have the right circle of people around them. They're not doing it on their own. 
Yeah, it all comes down to people. It all comes down to leaders accepting that they're not fully responsible for the end result, but the team is responsible for the end result and working with the right people. I, I truly believe that. And that includes a, a coach, a nutritionalist, a sports psychologist, the right chassis person, the right engine person. I mean, the list is long. There's a lot of people that don't get credit for the results that, that we see on television. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. It's an entire team effort and it really, you're only as great as your team. But um, we move into, you know, an interesting position in the sport because this has been one of the greatest AMA Supercross championships that I think we've had at the moment and Feld's really responded. And then there's the World Supercross Championship that's come along as of last year. So, you know, you're involved in both with the Firepower Honda team in the US and then the Honda Genuine team in the World Supercross Championship. So, you know, what is your, I guess, overall take on all of these things as it moves into the future? Yeah, it's a, it's been a terrific season in the US. Spectator attendance is great. The success we're seeing in the industry, I mean, it's quite buoyant at the moment. And I, I think that that translates to more people being involved and, and, and getting to the track and getting engaged between World Supercross and the Super Motocross World Championship at the moment. I'll say this, Supercross is a world sport. It's not something new, this World Supercross Championship. They've put a title to it. The world of Supercross, I mean, it's been apparent for, for 30 years that there is a place for World Supercross. Spokes Promotions brought Jeremy McGrath out. I'll never forget, I, I got his jersey. I shouldn't have given that one away. Like, uh, his number was M, but he made it out of Dunlop stickers that night. He reminded me back then there was more than one gear on a bike, but, you know, we'll get. I got past that after many visits to my psychologist. But no, no, in all seriousness, you know, back then in 1990, Philip Christensen was doing a great job with Spokes Promotions and Gosford. Christo put that on and it was sold out. It was 23 or 24,000 people. Uh, Berner came back. Chad Reed was there. He's always seemed to have come back and supported these races. And again, world of Supercross. There's a world for it. Paris Supercross sells out. I remember Gavin Faith riding for us and then, you know, getting on a plane and going to race the German Supercross series. You know, you've got the UK. Geneva. Uh, Brayton raced in Hawaii a few years back. Sure, it didn't have the attendance that they probably would have liked, but it had 14, 15,000. Toronto's always been pretty strong too. So I think there's definitely an audience globally. The biggest audience comes out of the US. The 70-odd percent of the sales for off-road motorcycles comes out of the US, so the, the primary market's clearly there. But I definitely think there's a place for Supercross globally. Regional markets globally have showed that with the attendances that um, these promoters, independent promoters, have achieved. Ozex Open. Ozex Open. You know, like I said, 30 years, there's history there for 30 years that suggests that there is a market outside of America for events. Mm -hmm. But the primary place is the States. The hard part with our sport is that the funding for these race teams comes from regional markets. So this, the money that's spent to race in America comes out of the American uh, manufacturer's budget sales or marketing or branding. Uh, for us in Australia, DACA's mine, the KDM groups, comes from the Australian uh, budget uh, or the Australian sales, and they, they decide what percentage of that they're willing to commit to go and participate. And in many cases, the same applies to Europe. American distributors certainly don't need to be spending their budget to take a team internationally. They're achieving success. They're achieving their target in America. I don't blame them for not wanting to spend money outside of America to compete. Well, it wouldn't make sense. Any sense. Where I think there could be benefit in a championship being ran globally is that the cost to compete 
wouldn't necessarily increase greatly because they have to travel to these events, east and west coast, you know, so they're all flying there. Sure, there's a truck, but there are flyaway cases that could go from uh, the west coast across to Europe, same as in MotoGP. But I think that the benefit would be out of industry partners would potentially invest more from a global marketing budget as opposed to a regional budget or, or you know national budget and that would reduce the spend that the manufacturers are spending because out of industry partners would see more value in owning or aligning with a team an asset I see benefit there. I, I believe the worth of riders would increase. I really struggle with economies of scale for the effort that goes into it. I think Mark Marquez collectively, which is between all of his personal partners, this is a great example actually, he's probably on anywhere between 17 and 20 million euro. I remember talking to John Tomac briefly when he was making, when they were making the transition and, you know, we're talking one and a half, two million dollars. Geographically, they're governed by the amount of money that can be spent on them because of their reach in the area they're in. They're not getting the type of monies that they possibly could. And Lewis Hamilton, I mean, we really don't know what he's earning. Is it 70 million euro? Is it 100 million euro with all of his um, ambassador deals? Um, you just don't know. And I, I, I don't want to uh, hazard a guess. I'll play devil's advocate just a little bit here on that. Say the NBA is a domestic American series, right? But LeBron would be paid by Nike Global. So that's sort of where, you know, though it's a domestic series, I don't know if LeBron's income from Nike, say, is coming from Nike America. No, but you could justify it. Um, Everyone can afford a basketball. Not everyone can afford a dirt bike and certainly not everyone's going out to buy a super bike. Yeah. So the combined reach for Marc Marquez by competing in all these different places around the world gives him greater value, I believe, than what Eli Tomac gets for competing in just America. First and foremost, the Feld program's the best program period. Mm -hmm. It's consistent. It's easy to quantify and it's tangible. Nothing beats it. It's going to take some time for something else to be of equal value to a partner. And that's the complex situation that we find ourselves in at the moment, commercially. Eli Tomac can be paid by a promoter, whether it be Paris, Ozex Open, Hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a weekend. That tells you there is value for that asset to be in that particular region. Mm -hmm. Now, Feld isn't paying a rider two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to turn up at A one. It's reliant on the industry to pay that rider. Feld spends hundreds of millions at the back end to make sure the championship runs. But my point that I'm trying to get across, whether or not Feld takes super motocross global or works with independent promoters or potentially works with world supercross. Clearly there are financial benefits for teams and riders if they are able to geographically expand their reach. It's difficult right now for the industry and manufacturers to justify spending more money we have a world motocross championship it's hitting the core consumer in europe uh, and talking to consumers regularly i think they're 18 or 20 races a year it's quite consistent yeah the uk are extremely strong and then now we've got a world supercross championship trying to talk to the same consumer mm -hmm. and at the end of the day they're selling a sport that's the brand, the sport, and it has consumer interest, but the consumer knows who the best riders are. And right now, that's who they're going to follow. Mm -hmm. So the only way for it to change moving forward 
I feel is there becomes one championship um, and or there becomes an acceptance that there's two championships but all riders can compete in both. Will that dilute the value of the Super Motocross World Championships to a part, to its partners? Yeah, for sure. There's only one amount of energy drink money. Monster doesn't want to be competing with Red Bull if Red Bull goes after the World Supercross Championship. And they, they want to control um, the asset that they've invested a lot of money in, being Supercross. So I think it's hard. I believe there should be a Supercross Championship, put aside what you call it, that uh, reaches markets outside of America. Mm -hmm. Australia, UK, Canada these sorts of places it's demonstrated there's appetite for it and i'd also take a step back and leave ego at the door and identify what other large motorsport formula one events could allow for uh, entertainment at the evening and that's how we're going to attract a new audience it's going to be extremely difficult to organically grow a new audience without piggybacking off the success of other motorsport events, mm -hmm. bringing new eyeballs to the sport is the only way I feel we're going to grow an audience outside of the audience we're currently got. We're competing with so many things now. I'm not just talking motorsport, all sports, 10, 15, 30, who knows, pay TV platforms. We're competing for people's time. Hey, once you watch this sport, a percentage of these people are going to fall in love with it. You can't help it. I remember we took Supercross to MotoGP and so many people hadn't seen it before. They've heard of dirt bikes. They've ridden in the bush. They haven't seen someone jump, you know, 80, 90 feet. Mm. They haven't seen four people go into a corner and one person come out and three on the floor. They haven't seen the excitement you get from being there and literally being, you know, three or four feet away from the action. The explosive action of it all. But to attract a new audience, we, we need to give them the sport. We need to present them with the sport for them to go, wow, we want to be a part of that. We want to go and buy a dirt bike. Or wow, our next door neighbor rides now. I've got something to talk to him about. And I'm going to watch Supercross with him on Saturday morning because I didn't realize how exciting it is. But I think the expense to go and try and procure a complete new audience through digital platforms, through a TV series is really hard. Seeing it on TV is not necessarily the same as seeing it live. And until you see it live, it's really difficult to appreciate it on television. You've got all these cameras above. You don't really appreciate the enormity of the jump, the 20 riders off a 20 meter start gate venturing into a, a six meter first turn all scrounging for that one position you, when you experience that live yeah it's difficult not to come away a fan it, you, you you'd have to completely dislike motorsport not to come away remotely interested in seeing it again yeah totally but you, you need to bring people to the track to see it first. And that's going to be hard if they haven't seen it before, no matter where you go. But there are some key markets that we could go to and we could look at changing some things up to potentially hit a new audience. But yeah, the world of Supercross, there is a platform globally for it. But I firmly believe and stand by the fact that there should be a... a a Supercross championship that ventures out of America. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd hate not to have a MotoGP here in Australia. Mm. Yeah. I'd hate not to have Formula One here. Mm. I'd hate never to be able to see Pink play live. Like seriously, if you start really breaking it down, I use Pink because obviously her husband's in the sport. I look at her and the Australian public lover, Ed Sheeran, sold 107,000 tickets two nights in a row, the MCG. Imagine if they never ventured out of England. Yeah. Or, or, or America. Yeah, it's a good point. We have the, straight up, I'm going to say it, I'm probably going to get criticised, the greatest Supercross athletes, arguably as a percentage, are in America. The rest of the world want to see them. Mm -hmm. It's only going to add value. 
Yeah. Ed Sheeran took money from, they didn't see it as money, gave 214,000 Australians an experience that they were happy to pay for and invest in. And they walked away feeling as though they had touched that artist. Mm -hmm. And people all over the world want to watch Supercross. They want to watch it live. They want to pay to watch it. They want to be a part of it. They want an Eli Tomac shirt or a Ken Roxon hat. They want a Jetson jumper. You know, people want Jetson donuts. The people in Europe will eat it. Uh -huh. Feld has done such a tremendous job in exposing the sport to an international audience and taking the sport to a level we haven't experienced before through so many different platforms, but they've, they've done that. People all over the world want to touch and feel these artists. They want to walk past these factory bikes that they've only ever seen in magazines or on YouTube. You know, they, they want to meet Lars, who they see get interviewed. They want to talk to Jeremy from, from Star. You know, seriously, they want to sit down with Roger DaCosta. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're talking about icons. Yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, Toto Wolf. It's Roger DaCosta. Yeah. Seriously, they're the same people. They're different, but the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, they're, they're leading the biggest brands in the world to international success. People want to, to talk to them, to hear from them, to, to, to learn from them and... KDM Group, Honda, Kawasaki, Suzuki, Yamaha have done such a tremendous job in building uh, Supercross globally because it's all the manufacturers that have come together to build this this sport globally. Mm -hmm. So let's take the sport that Feld has done so well with and position it in some other parts of the world so people can be touched by these athletes, by these artists, yeah. by these leaders, learn from them and aspire to be them one day i think it's imperative that we see that happen over the coming years i don't know when it will happen i ho i really hope it happens in my lifetime i hope i get to be a part of it i might have to step back because you know hrc the factory team out of america might have a bigger footprint globally but uh, i'd be selfish to say I, I didn't want to see that happen because i do i'll check my ego to see the sport take a new level. But the end user, the guy buying the ticket or the, the family, the female, whoever it is that loves the sport, they know who the best riders are. Mm -hmm. And those best riders need to be competing for this championship as the sport progresses and moves forward. And, I, and I'm glad that WSX has come along and um, hopefully somehow they can all come together. And if they can't, they can't. But I believe WSX will, again, highlight and prove that there is a global audience. Mm -hmm. um, how that transitions in the years to come, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, I, I certainly hope in my lifetime I see it. I, I hope I can take my kids or my nephews um, or nieces or, you know, my family to a true world supercross here in Australia. Yeah, it would be incredibly special. Incredibly special. I took my dad special. to MotoGP once. I took my dad to a ASBK dinner we had at Crown and Wayne Gardner was there. Mm. You know, okay, he's Australian, but he's Wayne Gardner and my dad was like, oh, yeah, he's my hero. Like I, I grew up watching him. All of these Aussies are growing up watching the Lawrences and they want to take their kids there because they want to say, hey, you could be that one day. Mm. It's really hard to feel that, to engage with that when you're not there live because it looks so far away and so difficult to, to achieve that people, you know, people don't think they're going to get there. You know, we think Tom Cruise is an illusion. We only ever see him on a big screen. We never see him live. But trust me, all these go-kart kids that go to F1 and they get to engage with their heroes because F1 has some great programs. The uh, uh, AGP have great programs that allow some of these kids 
to talk to some of their heroes. These kids take that, uh, they're sponges and, and they hold on to that and mm. think that there's hope. Um, there's so many benefits I see in, in one unified Supercross championship competing across the globe. It'll lift the value of riders. It'll lift the worth of race teams and it'll provide a greater return to the people that are investing in it, the promoters, you know, the manufacturers, the industry. So yeah, I, um, probably rattled on a bit long there, but I'm really passionate about wanting to see Supercross go global, but I'm also, uh, a traditionalist and a realist where I want to see the best riders compete. It's integral for the integrity of the championship and our sport that the best riders compete for a championship. So hopefully we, we, we see something happen in, in the not too distant future. Yeah. I think all of that makes a lot of sense. All of it really makes a lot of sense and articulated very, very well. Just touching on the commercial aspect of things, because I find that really interesting with what you've got going on with the Honda Australia program, the firepower team and the World Supercross team. How does that process take place? And are you heavily involved in the negotiations of, you know, the gear sponsors, the bike sponsors, what presents itself on the shrouds, who they want to sponsor, you know, the pipes that you run here versus elsewhere. Like how does, how does that all take place? Cause that seems like it'd be quite complicated and complex. It's difficult, you know, carrying on what we just spoke about. And it's very difficult to separate all of the championships because you arguably are talking to the same consumer, you know, and that's what we were talking about before about, you know, you're attracting budgets from different regions, but then when you have one program under one umbrella or under one business, it's difficult to separate it. It also dilutes its worth if you're across different brands under the one umbrella, even though they're separate programs. I'm completely across the procurement of all of our partners. I think it's important because if I don't believe in it and I'm not passionate about it, then it would be difficult for someone to invest in it. So I need to, I hate using the word sell. I have to campaign it. I have to believe in what I'm presenting. So yeah, I'm across all of our partnerships and, um, I'm again, very fortunate to have some, some great partners who have identified and been able to separate, uh, to the best of, to the best intention of each program, the value of each program. But at the end of the day, the reality of it is we're talking to similar consumers. So, you know, I need to be mindful of that. And, um, yeah, I love it. I love creative. I really need to believe in what I'm presenting though. I struggle being involved with partners that don't fully engage in what they're spending their money on either. I've dealt with that over the last 30 years where a sponsor comes and goes pretty quickly because they don't have the resource to capitalize on the money they're spending and activate. So it's deemed useless, not, you know, worthless. Yeah. So I'm very cautious these days on who we align with and I really work hard to identify why they're getting involved. If I don't see that it's going to be a long lasting relationship, I try and steer clear of it. Um, because I put so much into it. Like I invest so much into my partners. You know, they're so important to me. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for their support. Without it, we don't race. So I invest so much in them. Um, so it's extremely important that I align with the right people. And I am extremely mindful and respectful of who I'm representing, which is Honda. So again, I'm, I'm mindful of who I align with the Honda brand. Like I, I don't take it for granted. I learned early on, it's important to align with credible partners. Mm -hmm. You know, I've made that mistake, as I said in the beginning, you know, I had some partners that didn't follow through and they put me in a, a difficult position. But, um, yeah, I, I'm completely across the procurement of all of our, of all of our partners from doing the sponsorship proposals or partnership proposals to the activations, um, and, uh, we're closely to deliver to the best of our ability, everything that we, we set out to achieve. Mm. I think last one, 
for me with his chat and it's a really kind of generalized question is that I don't know how much you see yourself as having been involved in this world but I hope this chat sort of illuminated that a little bit from you know the very beginning and everything that you've been involved with for such a long time because you know I haven't seen all of it but I've seen a good deal of it and I think it helps to be you know notified of how much you've actually done in the sport and be able to look back on but you know, when you think about legacy and haven't been involved with it for such a long time, what is a legacy that you want to leave behind and be remembered for when it's, you know, all said and done? I don't necessarily like the word legacy. I, 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 legacy legend, I think that that's for legends and I'm certainly not one of them. I'm just uh, someone that's super grateful to do what, I, what I'm doing. You know, I look at certain people in this sport and what they've achieved that were associated with us or worked for me. You know, I made a lot of mistakes, um, but I believe the one thing that most of the people that have gone on to do great things, become great leaders, start their own businesses. Um, if your Eve can do it, we can do it. I love that. Some people don't. I don't get it. Um, Todd Waters is a great example. Love him. I don't care that he writes for Husqvarna. Oh, I love the fact that he'll come to me after every weekend and he'll go, you know, I started T-Dub and I'm doing this and I'm doing that, but you read it. It all stems from from seeing what you did and how you chased your dreams and how you applied common sense to everything that you did and you were okay with failing. So, you know, I sit back and I'm just so in awe of what other people are achieving by taking a little from what I have shown them is possible. I don't probably share it with Todd enough, but I'm super proud of him. I'm super proud that, that Josh Kasher has become a great dad. And, you know, when things got tough, he came to me. So, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful that he trusted me. Full circle with Dean Ferris. You know, it was in the infancy of me starting a race team and I, I had to learn to make decisions that weren't necessarily correct at the time. But full circle, we sat down, we worked through it, and we had a great year last year. We didn't win the championship. We finished second. Um, I'm sort of avoiding the question you asked. Don't quit. I'm going to get a bit emotional. Don't quit. Fuck what the naysayers say. It's tough. I put my helmet on doesn't matter what race, religion, what my name is. It was tough as a kid. And this sport just showed me that anything you put your mind to, you can achieve. And I've always gone about my life that way, is that if you dream it, just go for it. And I see what Todd Waters is doing, and I, and I see what Ben Townley's doing. We talk about business these days. Shane Boyd. I admire what Adam Bailey's done, you know, uh, he'll keep growing, he'll be successful, he'll make su mistakes, he'll be successful, but he worked for me, Ben Williams, and I always get uncomfortable talking about it because people probably think that I'm um, taking credit. No, no credit. I made so many mistakes when they were working for me, but they learned from that, and I provided that, and then they became great, super great at what they did because they saw that anything that you put your mind to and work hard for, you can achieve. So legacy, legacies are for legends. And I, I, I'm certainly not that. I'm humbled every day by seeing the struggles of others in this world and then the opportunities that I've been given. And, and without people like Honda, I know this... This isn't about a, a, a commercial podcast, but I need to give full credit. Without the backing and belief of some of the people that I'm surrounded by, I wouldn't be here today to even have this conversation. But the only thing people should learn from me is don't quit. Don't be afraid to fall over. Smack your head. Be called names. Don't be afraid to be shamed because you're going to make some monumental errors. But if you look at the greatest leaders in this world, the, the greatest success stories, you only ever see the, the guy sitting there with the million dollar car or the $10 million home, but you, 
You need to understand that, geez, that person fell over so many times to get there and they didn't quit. And um, social media and other platforms don't necessarily show that. They show the end result. But, yeah, I have made a lot of mistakes. I've broken many bones as a racer and I certainly am far from happy with what I've achieved. Um, and I think that's why I keep pushing to do more. So, yeah, just don't quit. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't go into it wanting to fail or expecting to fail, but don't be afraid to fail. Um, you know, you only have to look at history. Thomas Edison and many other great leaders, Henry Ford, Richard Branson, when you really start learning about some of the most successful people in this world, how many times they've failed along the way. So, yeah, all right. We have lost more races than we have won, and I have crashed more times than I'd like to admit. But you just get up and you just go, okay, that sucked. What do I learn from that? How do I try and avoid doing that again? And how am I going to be better? And, um, yeah, if, if you want to call it a legacy, don't be afraid to fall down, but always get back up. Always get back up. And don't measure success with money. Measure success with personal gratification. Okay, it's always about gratitude. Always about personal gratification about something that you put effort into. Yeah. yeah reading a book. Uh, learning an instrument, learning a new language, planting a tree. The little things that you do in life that you feel uh, that you've achieved something with, take those achievements. Mm. It's not about what's in your bank account. Uh, if if it was, I wouldn't be racing in America, you know. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, I think it comes full circle to how we started this thing, you know, with yourself and your dad, you know, once again, his big thing of success was making sure that you had hot food and he had hot food. And, you know, that's where it's important to, you know, recognize those things. My dad still rings me every day. He's um, a little bit more fragile these days than, 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 than what I'd like. And fuck, the one thing he asks me every day is, how are you? Is your car okay? Because he wants to know I get around because things were really tough when we were young. We, we had food and we had clothes, but they were tough. I don't think, I think my, my parents sheltered me from how tough it was getting, you know, getting by and paying the bills and they didn't want to disappoint me, but yeah, um, I, I am getting emotional, but I don't feel like I've sacrificed a single thing. I don't feel like I work. I walk into this workshop and I just, I just feel blessed to be able to get up, turn my computer on, answer emails, talk to the people I get to talk to. I mean, I'm still in awe of it. I never take it for granted. And I want to stand on the top step of the podium. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to do it every day. And I'll keep doing it until they tell me I can't. No, that's really cool. And once again, hopefully this podcast has shown some of the stuff you've done. But again, I really appreciate it. This is, you know, the first guest and I have known you for a long time. So I'm honestly really thrilled to have had this chat with you and to be able to go through all of these things and yeah, I would just really appreciate it. Crazy, full circle. Full circle. Taught you at Nutter Wadding and Sally not too long ago we just had an event there for uh, the Good Friday Appeal that uh, just reminds me of how fortunate we are to be sitting here doing this and um, I'm thankful that you chose me as your uh, first guest. Like we said at the start, I don't like necessarily doing these, but um, I, I've seen what you're doing with your life and I, I admire that and um, I'm, I'm proud to see where you're at. I was coaching you on a dirt bike and, and now you're trying to launch something that's super special because you're equally passionate about it and um, I hope it's super successful. Nervous to see this, but I, I, I can't wait to see where, where you take this. Your, your integrity is intact, and if anyone asks me, I would tell them the same thing, to be really comfortable and confident to sit down and talk to you about uh, everything to do with the sport, anything else in life. Mm -hmm. oh, that means a lot. It really means the world to me. But uh, that's this episode of The Ride Network and episode number one for the podcast, so thank you, Yurif Komsky. 
Well, I only had eight questions. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Thanks. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>